Well, thanks everybody for coming this morning. Um, I'm Donnie Faring and I'm from Beach, North Dakota. And uh, my wife Trisha is here too. Um, we applied, I guess, a couple years ago for this Sarah grant. We we're fortunate enough to, to get it. Um, ours is entitled Utilizing Cover Crops to Increase Productivity and Health on Vigor on Tame Grass. And uh, I guess I'll give you a little history about our, uh, my wife and I, we, we got married in 98. Um, we both grew up on, on cattle ranches. Um, but we, when we bought this property, I guess I'll move on to the next slide here. Um, I'll give you a little history about us, but it's my wife and my two kids. Um, in 98, we got married. We moved on to um, having cattle on shares with my father-in-law. Then in um, 2007, we moved to Beach, North Dakota. We were fortunate enough to get onto this section of ground that we we're on. We were leasing it. Um, 2009, we were be able to buy it. Um, we moved on into uh, 10 and 11. And 11 and 12, the, the years were very different than night and day. And I'll show you some pictures here. Um, I guess here it is, talks about a description of our Sarah ground. We wanted to rejuvenate the brome grass. But this was a picture of our property um, before um, we owned it, I guess. And the, to the, I, I don't know if you can see, but this would be right in here where we did our, our Sarah Grant project. <coughs> um, it was farmed prior to 1983. And in 1983, it was seeded back to pretty much brome, alfalfa, and western wheat. Well, it's been grazed by horses and cattle, and the production went down on it. And so like in 2011, I'll get, this is our picture in 2014, I guess, of overview of it. Then we move on to 2014, we took um, some uh, transact, uh, spots where we got some soil samples and you can see that there and we move on to our next one this is another one in 2014 you can see our 2004 excuse me the different types of the soil imagery 2009 you can see where the uh, this video slide here shows a lot about um, where the water was and you can see the <laughs> the veins for the horses and the cattle um, making veins. And these are kind of gullies or washouts. I, I wouldn't know if I'd call them gullies. I just call them washouts. But we call them proper areas. And like Phil Jerry was talking about last night about um, uh, filling in the bare grounds. I guess that's what we look at these white spots on here as bare ground. And we just have to get more cover on them. So. 2014, this is, identifies our spots, I guess, where we, where we did. Um, this is the two 20-acre past, uh, pastures, or the projects that we did. We did seeded this 20 acres in 2013, this one in 2014. And now you can see where we put our, put our, our house, our building, um, the cross fences and the trees and everything that we're doing there. But as you can still see, there's still lots of areas where we need more, more cover and more, I guess we call it organic matter we need to put on the ground. We were in with NRCS uh, with the CSP program, so we do uh, photo points. Um, this is a photo point we took in 2012. And as you can see by this picture, um, there is pretty good cover on the ground, but we would like it to be better. Um, 2012 was a really dry year for us. We probably didn't even have six inches of moisture probably that year. A lot of the brome grass on this field and project got three to four inches and never even headed out. Um, so that's what got us kind of thriving into this Sarah Grant or into this project is that we needed to get more production out of it. And for us, um, we don't own any hay ground, um, so we want to utilize as much grazing as we can throughout the whole year. So 
we had to look at different ways and, and we kind of sat down with NRCS and the county agent and that's how we kind of come up with the SARE grant. So we have, and we were traveling around to some other meetings like this and got the idea, I guess, for cover crops. Um, you can see there's some weeds there, there's different things and not a lot of just activity. Everything's kind of dead and brown and I'll show you as we go along here with our photo points. This is a, just an overview again of it in 2012 and I think it was taken probably in the fall, probably the end of October, first, first of November. That fall we started um, in early winter after we weaned, we were doing some bale grazing. This is just a picture of some of our our heifer calves um, using bale grazing. Some more, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, is that waste or is it, you know, I have neighbors that just scream at me like I'm wasting too much hay, but we look at it as we're putting more organic matter on the ground and more material. So this is a breakdown, I guess, of our costs and expenses that we entailed in 2013. Um, we went ahead and sprayed it um, 30 ounces and we seeded it and this is our cover crop that, a mix that we used. Um, we had Gabe Brown I guess from Bismarck and um, Kenny Miller from Bismarck kind of help us with the different varieties and what we want to try to accomplish with it. Um, we, that, that year this is the seeding that we did and the rate. Um, as you can see the canopy we um, we didn't have, you know, in the brome, 22% versus our native. We tested uh, patches, you know, around there. As you can see, we just don't have bare ground. Was that 40%? You know, litter, 23. We just didn't have the cover on there that we'd like to see. And we did a soil test, and I don't think we did another one just put on here, but our infiltration, that's another thing. We wanted to try to keep more water on our property and not have it all go down to the creek or to our neighbors. And as you can see on this, we, we need some work because we only can take an inch per hour and versus the native, it's you know, a lot better. So, um, and you can see our NPK where we're at there and per acre. So, um, there's people that thought, you know, that this is awful expensive way but if you were going to break it up and farm it for two, three years, you got a lot of expense into that too. So, um, and at the time, hay wasn't cheap either. So we're, we're just trying to find different ways and make this property work. So if you guys have any questions at the end, we can talk more about that. This is um, in July of that same year. We had a little over three inches, I guess, and probably I think about 45 minutes. And as you can see, this is part of the field that we seeded and uh, what the water's doing and how it's, it's going down to the creek and to our neighbors. And that's something that we're working on. We wanted to try to get more organic matter to get the water to stay, stay on our property instead of going to the neighbors. And it just, we were pretty nervous it was gonna take our road out. That's our driveway. Um, luckily it didn't, but it made our road a little more narrower. But, and then this was after the rain. As you can see here, um, this was, the cover crop was just seeded the end of June, but this is the field here. Um, the darker spots were places that I bale grazed that winter. Um, you know, there's just more, more material there and you can see where we sprayed and, and uh, it's kind of, we didn't get the best, best probably kill job on it, but we didn't really want to kill the brome. All we wanted to do was just kind of set it back. This was taken in September that fall. We had a, a, our county agent and, and NRCS kind of had a Golden Valley uh, cover crop tour. We went to three different locations, I guess, in the county. And um, this is our stop on our 20 acres that we did that year. And as you can see back where we were headed to there, um, these darker spots is where I bale grazed and there's more organic matter there and just more litter and more nutrients from the cattle, so. And what we grazed there, I guess, that fall, um, we had 14 yearling bulls on there for basically 41 days and 
on the cover crop. And then after that, November 20th, it started getting cold and, and uh, we thought they had most of it grazed off pretty good, so we started supplementing. And, then, and this is our CSP um, photo shoot for that next fall. And this is after we bale graze some of there, so you can see the darker, uh, darker rings here. This would be where we probably bale graze. There's a lot more vegetation. Um, our rainfall probably was double or, well, probably almost triple in 2013 to versus 2012. And you can see the brome grass got a lot thicker, but there's a lot more plant vegetation there. So, so we are making improvements. At least we feel like we are, but it's a, a, a long road ahead of us yet. Um, we think back, you know, they farmed it until 1983, you know, and didn't do a lot. I think we've been in a take-take mode, so now we're trying to be more proactive the other way. So it might take us 30 years to get it, get it back. This was taken last winter or spring, I guess. This is um, another part of the property there where we were bale grazing. And my wife just thought it was kind of a neat picture how them bulls were laying down there and where we were bale grazing. And they used that for their bedding, I guess. So. Um, this is part of our crew here. It's Harley and Taylor, our two daughters, I guess, rolling out hay. And, and uh, that's part of it, too, why, we, why we're doing some of this. It's for them in the future. But this is another one in the spring. Well, I guess I should go on to 2014, what we did. We uh, were at a conference, I guess, with, with Dr. Huber and talked about Roundup. And so next year, the negatives of it. So we thought, well, let's try something different. Let's just use our cattle. So in the May of uh, 2014, we just grazed it. We moved 50 pairs on there for, I think, 10 days. And we just grazed the property down. And as you, that's what the cows and calves are doing out there now. Um, we just wanted to set the brome grass back and go in and seed it. So June, or another one May, we're out putting mineral out for the cattle. And all this is actually apple cider vinegar, too, we were putting out for them. But uh, <clears throat> me and the crew. Then this is a picture that we take, too, of uh, dung beetles. Um, as you can see there, there's quite a bit of action going on in there. Um, you know, kind of exciting. Um, the kids, they really enjoy it. We call this our field tour. Um, they're excited about digging through dung beetles. They're looking for them, and they think it's pretty cool. You know, it's like they run from one dung pile to the next, and they wanna, they wanna find out. You know, and so they're six and four, so it's everything to them is pretty new and exciting. You know, so 2014, this is what we did. Um, we we decided to go a little earlier. We wanted uh, to get more out of our cover crop. I know people say you can seed it later, but we wanted to go earlier and get see if we can get more growth, more production out of it. So we went a little earlier. May 25th, we, we did the 40 pairs of high stock density. And then we took them out of there, I think on the 7th of June I was on the one side. The first 20 acres we seeded on June 5th. The other 20 acres we did on June 10th. Um, we had our local Golden Valley County Soil Conservation District do it. As you see, our costs are a lot less this year just due to the fact we didn't have to spray. We didn't have to hire somebody to spray the Roundup, <coughs> buy the Roundup. Um, we changed our seeding a little bit. Um, we tried um, some grazing corn and the hairy vetch um, and kale. The terms and rashers were the same. Um, the year before, we tried cow peas. Um, didn't really see much growth there with them, but, but uh, the rest of those, we, we did see something out of all of them. <coughs> so. And this is June 5th. This is what it looked like before when we were seeding it. Kind of, this is the west half of the 20 acres. As you can see there, uh, I just just point out here, this is southwest water. Um, come through and plowed a trench through there, so you can see the bare ground there. But here there's also other bare ground spots. So That's our 
thing we're trying to work on, I guess, trying to get, get it to grow better. <coughs> There's our Soil Conservation District seeding it. Yes, give you a. We still had some chemical residue, I guess, um, too. That's another thing we wanted to see on this slide. You can see the strips where parts of the brome grass is still, I guess, desiccated or dead from the roundup from the year before. Another picture of it pointing the other way. This is to the north. And we, we didn't want to kill the brome grass, I guess, just more or less set it back, and we feel like it was set back. Fairly decent, I guess. Another picture, I guess, of the our soil conservation district. <clears throat> this was taken a month later, and we're checking out our cover crop, what's coming, and she's pictured there by a, a soybean. Um, I, I thought we were kind of crazy for putting soybeans in there. I didn't think they could grow that far west, but you get enough moisture, get the right things growing, they'll, they'll still grow. And they actually did fairly quite well for what I thought. They, they didn't get really, you know, no height, but, you know, three, three four inches, you know. So we were, we were excited. And I, you know, they're really good for the cattle and good for the land. So that's a picture of the hairy vetch. Um, the cattle just, they love hairy vetch. Um, and I think they do very, very well off of it. So picture of that. And you can see kind of some of the litter on the ground. And we're trying to get more of that on that. This is another picture taken from the west half. As you can see the rows of the, look some of the corn coming. Um, you know, some of this other stuff it's harder to see, but you know, we did have a good sweet clover year last year, so you can see some sweet clover coming in there. Um, another picture, bigger overview of it. This is kind of more on the east side of it, but you can see some of the soybeans and some of the corn and other things coming in. Granted, I mean, it's not like you guys down here where you get corn 8, 10, 12 feet high, but for us, it's, it's exciting. This is a trouble spot that we have um, with bare ground. It's a, a hard pan, I guess, like they were talking about last night. Um, this excites us, too, because we did some bale grazing on it um, in the spring. And just goes to show we need to do more of it. But how the cover crop or the soybeans and the, and the hairy vetch was, was trying to come through there. And that's, that's good because normally it would just be bare, bare dirt. And we don't want that. And we don't want to be losing it. And, and uh, so we were, we were pretty excited about this picture. And it's a photo point that we can watch for years to come. Another one here, you can see where we bale grazed here. We had oats and peas, and there's some voluntary oats coming there. So, and it's a lot better, more thriving there than where, where it isn't. So, another picture to, towards the north there to our place. Um, we showed you before how it was dead or desiccated there, and now it's filling in, and you can see some of the Sunflowers coming, you know, they don't get very tall, but the cattle, they just love them. They do really well. Um, be surprising um, when we dump them out in the cover crop. They kind of, I don't know, we were, first couple years we did cover crops and we turned cattle on, we were worried about prostate acid or, or bloat or whatever, but they really, they adjust their diet, I guess, to it, and they like the buffet style. One day they'll eat the millet, or the next day they'll eat the sunflowers. And um, I think cattle or livestock as a whole are a lot smarter than what us humans give them credit for. I think sometimes maybe we're the ones that cause problems. This is what we did in 2014. Um, we grazed 28 yearling bulls there from October 13th to the 7th. And then we started supplementing them. Um, you know, maybe wouldn't have had to start supplementing them, but we had our, our sale on November 22nd, so we were trying to get the bulls still in, in, in good, you know, sale condition. So, so we did for 25 days, and they could still go out there and, and still graze the cover crop, but um, they also come in to, to eat, 
to eat the hay too. Then in September, we had um, the North Dakota Grazing Coalition came to our place and we did a pasture walk. We had roughly about 35 producers there. This is just a picture of some of that. Um, they're not really on the cover crop, they're on some um, pasture that we um, graze and we did a high intensity grazing there. And so there, people are standing around talking, I guess, and visiting what, what we saw and what we didn't see. This is a picture in the fall, more of our bale grazing. And uh, we brought the bulls home there and, and uh, the girls are seeing how tall she is, I guess. Or. This is our photo point again for CSP. This would be um, taken again, I guess, in the fall. And you can see um, some of the bale rings again where we bale graze, where they're a little darker green or where it isn't. Um, I don't know. I need to get probably GPS and be more point specific, I guess. But we're you know pretty close every year where we're at. But, um, but there's definitely getting to be more different varieties of grass there. It's not just brome. It's a lot denser to the soil. This is a picture of some of the tools I guess we like to use in our ranch, in our place. Um, portable windbreak has been a, a wonderful asset for us because um, it just opens up our grazing. We can, I take the loader bucket and I can take them anywhere I want to and, and uh, set them down. And um, it's a tool I think we're going to use for a lot more years too. So it, uh, and this is our picture of our tanks, uh, one of our frost free water tanks. Um, they uh, are completely energy free. Um, the number of cattle that you uh, have on them makes a difference. You know, if it's 10 below, you will get some ice if you're under 100 head. Um, we have one to the east where we run our main cow herd, I guess, of 120 cows, but she'll stay pretty open until it's probably 10, 15 below because there's enough cattle drinking there and every day it gets a new flush of water in there. So. And it's kind of pointed to the southeast where it still gets some sun, so. And, and then this is a, another picture, I guess, a slide of kind of where the dark green spots, I want you to see where we've been bale grazing and intensifying and getting more organic matter on the ground. This is a, a kind of a waterway like we saw in that first one that was deep and there wasn't much litter there and so we're working on those. Um, these here too are some places we fed last spring and trying to get more organic matter and, and more productive. And I think this whole deal, I think if we get more nitrogen and more organic matter on the ground, it's more surface, I think the brome grass and everything will rejuvenate better. So, but I think we took for 30 some years or 50 years and uh, we have a f farmer, I guess, north of us. Um, he's always asking me about cover crops, and he, he says, well, what do you think? And he's like, well, I, I, I think he wants uh, to be a genie in a bottle. Like, I'm supposed to give him the answer and just poof, you know, it's going to increase his wheat by 10 more bushels, you know. I, I, I don't have that answer, so. It's not a, not a cure-all, but I think it's another tool. In conclusion, I guess like I've been talking about, we need to increase our organic matter and keep bale grazing and uh, keep utilizing cover crops. And the verdict is still out there, I guess, on the brome and what will happen to it. But, you know, we're okay with the brome being in there and we're okay with whatever else has been coming in there. So when we did, I, I didn't tell you that, but on that east side where we did more of the intense uh, uh, grazing last spring, we did start seeing some western wheatgrass coming and so it just shows that the seed was there and uh, it's, it's in the ground there. It just needs to be able to compete with the brome and get a chance to come. So, um, is this why we do it? It's for our four-year-old and six-year-old so we can spend more time for out turtle hunting. So, <laughs> But uh, we uh, would like to thank the Sarah Grant people, I guess, for us given the opportunity to try this project and we're still learning a lot and have a long ways to go and our ranch is, needs a lot of work but uh, you know the Roman Empire wasn't built overnight so we we feel like we 
or making baby steps, I guess. So. The question was, um, can you see the difference where we sprayed the Roundup and where we didn't? Um, yes. Uh, it just didn't have to compete quite as much with the, with the brome um, where we did spray the Roundup. It, it probably come up and emerge a lot faster. Um, on the east side where we did not spray any of the Roundup, it was interesting. The soybeans did quite well there. Um, we didn't see a lot of height, but you know, three, four inches, but they still competed with the brome. Um, I, the verdict is still out there, I guess. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think it still needed something to set that brome back, but we didn't want to farm it. We didn't want to plow it up, I guess, maybe to answer your question. But, um, but I still think it comes down to the tool that maybe we don't even need to spray anything. The tool is there. We need to use the cattle maybe more and put the nitrogen and the, the poop and the manure down on, you know, use our livestock and, and not, not worry about the chemical. And <clears throat> with the Roundup, you probably could get faster results, you know. You could probably get there faster, but, you know, yeah, I don't, I'm not saying you need to use it. Did that help answer your question? Or? Yeah. 